We are looking at the most basic data structures. Bunches are unpackaged and unindexed. Sets are packaged but not indexed. Strings are indexed but not packaged. And lists are both packaged and indexed. We've done bunches and sets. Now we'll do strings. A string is an indexed sequence. Nil is the empty string. And here is a one-item string. In a bunch or set, we talk about its elements. In a string or list, we talk about its items. There's no difference between a one-item string and the item. Any number, any character, any binary value, any set, and any list is a one-item string. Now, here is a four-item string. Semicolon is the string catenation operator, or maybe you call it concatenation. Anyway, it means joining together. Here's the string length operator, saying the length of this string is 4. You could measure its length by placing it on a string measuring ruler. The numbers on the ruler are called indexes. Notice that the indexes come between the items. That way, when you're at index 2, there's no confusion about which items have been processed and which items still remain to be processed. If index 2 were directly under an item, it wouldn't be clear whether that item has been processed or not. That's why the writing cursor in your word processor or text editor goes between the letters instead of flashing a letter. And the length wouldn't look right either. So if, you've, if you're ever drawing a picture, put the indexes between the items. In, items are indexed from 0. So in this string, item 2 is the 7. That way, when you're at index n, the number of items that have been processed is n, and the next item to be processed is item n. There aren't any plus ones or minus ones to think about. It's always n. The next example just shows that you can index a string with a string of indexes and get a string of results. Now I want to spend a little time talking about indexing from zero. Zero was invented after the positive numbers, the negative numbers, the fractions, and even after irrational numbers. Old Euclid knew about irrational numbers 2,500 years ago, but zero started being used only about 1,000 years ago and is still not completely accepted as a number. Actually, there are many people who have a very poor understanding of numbers. There's a wonderful book by John Allen Paulos called Enumeracy, Mathematical Illiteracy and Its Consequences, and its successor titled Beyond Numeracy, that tell just how badly people understand numbers. They're not required reading for this course, but if you have time, I recommend them. I've seen this price tag on something that costs 10 cents. It says it costs a tenth of a cent. And I've seen a gas price written like this. What's the second decimal point for? It's just wrong. Now back to zero. Many people seem to dislike the number zero. Some don't even accept it as a number. If someone says, there are a number of things to discuss, they don't mean there might be zero things to discuss. They don't know what zero means, and they don't know what to do with it. On a tax form or accounting form, you sometimes see the directive, subtract line A from line B. If there's no difference, write nil. On your keyboard and telephone, zero is placed after nine which is mathematically silly. Here is a page from the 1991 Canadian Census. It might be hard to read here, but the middle question asks, 
how many persons who have a usual home somewhere else in Canada stayed here overnight between June 3 and June 4, 1991. Then there's a circle to tick, to tick off if, if there were none, and a box to fill in if there were some. So what's the point of the circle? If the right answer is zero, why not just fill in zero in the box? In fact, when they get back the census form, they do key in zero for anyone who ticked off the circle. But the people who make up the form are smart. They know that if they didn't put the circle there, they would get a lot of phone calls from people who say they can't answer the question because there were none. Here's a page from the front of the Toronto phone book from 1991. It's also hard to read, so I'll just tell you the column I'm interested in says TD at the top. It's the time difference between Toronto and other places. They put plus 8 to Cameroon and minus 4 to the Cook Islands, so they know about positive and negative numbers. But to Columbia, it says NA. And if you look up at the legend, it says, time difference not applicable. I guess they knew something was wrong, because here's the 1993 phone book, and if, if you can find Columbia, you see it has an equal sign. Every place else gets a number, but Columbia gets an equal sign. And that's the way it stayed until 1997, when Bell Directories finally discovered the number zero but they still felt the need to explain that one number in the legend. It says no time difference. When you measure, you must start at zero. If your measuring tape or ruler or scale does not start at zero, then it gives wrong answers. And counting is measuring. If your odometer on your car didn't start at zero, then your car was used when you got it. After you're born, you are zero years old for a whole year before you are one year old. Any other way of counting gives wrong answers. For example, in music, they start counting intervals at one. An octave is an interval of eight. What interval is two octaves? Care to guess? Well, it's 15. Musical arithmetic doesn't work because they start from 1. Year arithmetic doesn't work because the year 0 was left out from a specific date, say July 1, in year X, to the same date in year Y, should be Y minus X years. And it would be if the year 0 had been included in the year numbering. But it's off by 1 if the interval crosses the boundary between BC and AD. The debate a few years ago about whether the new millennium starts in 2000 or in 2001 was about exactly that point. The Fortran language of 1955 had a loop construct whose body had to be executed at least once. I suppose it seemed senseless to have a loop whose body might be executed zero times. Today, we're quite used to counting as follows. Count gets zero. While there's another one, increase count by one. We start the count at zero, and the loop and the body of the loop might be executed zero times. Just imagine how many bugs were caused by starting at one, or by requiring that there be at least one iteration of the loop. The error was corrected in Algol in 1958, and in PL1, and in Pascal, in part. Iteration might be zero times, but the data structure over which one is iterating, the array, had to have at least one element. In Pascal, that meant there was no empty string, and that set the algebra of data structures back about 50 years. For mathematics, and for computation, it is clear that we must count from zero. Thanks to the circuit builders, we're used to memory addressing starting with zero, 
and from the C and Java programming languages, we're used to indexing from zero. But for many people, it still seems wrong to start from zero and right to start from one. That's because we were taught to count from one when we were very young. We tend to believe whatever we are taught when we are very young as if our lives depended on it, because they often do. Evolution has thus favored uncritical infants. As a result, we hold a lot of critically unexamined beliefs. Whenever someone challenges something we learned when we were very young, we may feel threatened, as if our foundation is crumbling. Just the existence of people without those beliefs is a threat to those beliefs. People go to war. They're at war right now, killing each other to defend their cherished but insupportable beliefs. The feeling of rightness when we count one, two, three, as we were taught, and that any other way is wrong, is just that same defense. In this course, anything under my control will be numbered from zero. Anything not under my control will probably be numbered from one. One of the problems is the association of the word first with the number one. In English, there's no connection between them. First means preceding all others in time, order, or importance. The first channel on my TV is channel two. The first house on my street is numbered 35. The first hour of the day is numbered 12 on most clocks and zero on the 24 hour clocks. The first year of my life is numbered zero. The words first and second have no more claim to any particular number than does the word last. The word second means following the first. But the association between first and one is so common that many people write one st for first as the one were fur. Similarly, they write 2nd for second, as though 2 were seco. It makes just as much sense, maybe even more, to write first as 0st. That's first, and second as 1nd. Well, let's get rid of those quickly. The words third, fourth, and so on are attached to numbers. But which ones? Your third year of life is age two. If you start with the first annual picnic in year 2012, in which year do you have your 10-year celebration? Is that the 10th annual picnic? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says the 11th hour means the latest possible time. But is the 11th hour of the day the last hour from 11 o'clock to midnight? Is it even the last hour of the last half of the day? Or is it the hour from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, in which case it isn't the latest possible time? My advice is avoid the words third, fourth, and so on. They are too error-prone. Never say the 15th item. Say item 15, if that's the one you mean, or item 14, if that's the one you mean. The first item in a string is item zero. It is not the zeroth item. That's what people say when they are unable to distinguish between first and one. If you mean the item that comes first, say the first item, or item zero. Well, that was a long rant. Let's get back to strings. There's an ordering on strings called lexicographic order. It's the same order used in dictionaries. The first item, where two strings differ, determines the order. Here it's the 6, coming before the 7. 
If one string runs out before there's a point of difference, the shorter string comes first. Here's a notation like we had for bunches, but there's a semicolon here instead of a comma. It means the string of integers starting at x and going up to but not including y. So the length of x to y is y minus x with no plus 1 or minus 1 to worry about. And if you catenate x to y and y to z, you get x to z. There's no gap and no overlap. There's a special notation for text, which means a string of characters. You just put the characters between a pair of left and right double quotes. And if you want a double quote mark in the text, as in this example, you have to put it twice. Of course, you could also write it out long, like this. Since a text is a string, we can use string operators, like indexing. And if we use a string of indexes, we get a subtext. Now, here's a string of three items. Item 0 is the bunch nat, item 1 is 1, and item 2 is the bunch 0 to 10. String catenation, the semicolon, distributes over bunch union, just like addition and subtraction do. So a string of bunches is a bunch of strings. This one is all those strings whose item 0 is in nat, whose item 1 is 1, and whose item 2 is in 0 to 10. And here is just one such string. The inclusion has to hold item by item. There's a repetition operator. This is a repetition of 3 times the string 4, 5. And the one operand version, which is often called the Cleany star, after the great logician Stephen Cleany, means any number of repetitions of the string. And finally, there's an operator to make a new string that's just like an old one, except that one item is replaced. So, that's it for strings. Take a deep breath, or stretch a bit, and we'll go straight on to lists. A list is a string in a package just like a set is a bunch in a package. Square brackets are the list formation operator. This is a list of three items. Here's another list of three items. Item 0 is nat, item 1 is 1, item 2 is 0 to 10. List formation distributes over bunch union. So a list of bunches is a bunch of lists and the list 0, 1, 2 is one of those lists. And all those lists are included in the bigger bunch consisting of all lists of three naturals. And they are included in the even bigger bunch of all lists of naturals of any length. <coughs> it may sound strange to say a list of bunches is a bunch of lists. The math isn't strange. That's just a distribution law. What's strange is the English. A list is a singular noun, and a bunch of lists is plural. But a list with an item that's not an element is not an elementary bunch, even though it is a singular noun in English. To help you see the pattern, let me show you other distribution laws. The negation of a bunch is the same as a bunch of negations. The product of sums is the same as a sum of products. A conjunction of disjunctions is the same as a disjunction of conjunctions. And a list of bunches is the same as a bunch of lists. So that's the pattern. Next is the content operator which is the inverse of list formation and produces the string which the list contains. 
It's a sort of squarish looking tilde. Then the list length operator. Do you see why it has to be different operator from string length? What would we get if we applied the string length operator to that list? We get one because a list is a single item. Then indexing, which is of course from zero. Then list composition. That means indexing a list with a list of indexes. And we get a list of results. The list catenation operator is a small raised plus. In all the programming languages I know, there's no agreement on the catenation operator symbol. So I hope this one is okay with you. Lists are ordered lexicographically, just like strings. And the last list operator is a bit complicated because it has three operands. Modification takes an index, and an item, and a list and produces a new list that's a lot like the old one except that at the given index there's the given item. Maybe we could say it like this 2 maps to 22 and otherwise it's 10 to 15. I want to talk about modification for another moment just to try to prevent an error that some people might make. Suppose L is the list 10 to 15, and we want to evaluate two maps to L3 and three maps to L2, and otherwise L. Well, first of all, let's write out list L. Now we start with L, there, and we modify item 3 to be what item 2 is there. And now we modify item 2 to be what item 3 is. Well, it already is the same, so we're done. And that's the wrong answer. Do you see what went wrong? Let's start again and do it right. Starting with L was correct there, and we modify item 3 to be what L2 is. There. And now we modify item 2 to be L3. There. The point is that all three of the L's in that expression refer to L, the original list, not to some list that's part way through modification. I hope that clears up any possible misunderstanding about that. Indexing distributes over bunch union, no matter whether you're indexing a string or a list. If you use a bunch of indexes, you get a bunch of items. Likewise, if you use a set of indexes, you get a set of items. If you use a string of indexes, you get a string of items. And if you use a list of indexes, you get a list of items. Putting them all together, if you index with any complicated structure, you get that same structure of items. Here's an example of a string being indexed with a structure, resulting in that same structure of string items. And if you index a list with that structure, you get that same structure of list items. There was a programming language called APL long ago with that feature, and I think currently the language J has it. It's really handy. The list examples so far have been one-dimensional, but a two-dimensional list is nothing new. It's just a list whose items are lists. A two-dimensional list used to be called an array, but now programmers use the word array for any number of dimensions. This particular array is included in the 3 by 4 arrays of naturals. If we index it with just a 1, we get row 1. 
that's a list. So we can index it with a 2, say, and we get its item 2, which is the array item from row 1 and column 2. The main point I'm making now is, if you want an item, don't use a comma and don't use brackets. We're using comma consistently for bunch union. So the first one is a bunch of two rows. And that's not what you wanted. And the second one is also not what you wanted. What you wanted is this. This may seem like a lot of notation to you. We've covered most of the notations of the whole course. We just have functions to go. This may be the first time you've seen a comprehensive and consistent set of theories. Usually you take binary theory in one course, set theory in another, and list theory in yet another, and they don't fit together because of a clash of notations. And you don't have all the axioms, so things aren't perfectly well defined. And you can't make any formal proofs. I guess that's okay if you only prove things informally, or don't prove them at all, and it doesn't really matter if you get it wrong. But if you have to get it right, or you want a theorem prover to help you, or if you want to build a theorem prover to help other people, you would have to have a comprehensive and consistent set of notations. So now you have. Mathematicians are not usually so picky about their notations. They can often get away with saying, oh, come on, you knew what I meant. But there's no use saying that to a compiler or to a prover. You have to use exactly the notations they use. In this course, think of the marker who marks your tests as a compiler or prover. Use exactly the right notations.